Hello everyone, and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This time, we're going to be taking a look at the Diels-Alder reaction, which is a very simplistic yet nuanced reaction that has a wide variety of applications in organic synthesis. By the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer are how do Diels-Alder reactions occur? What types of compounds participate? How is the Diels-Alder reaction regioselective? And how is it stereospecific? If you'd like an introduction to delocalized systems or to conjugated dienes, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel, and also take a look at those videos I've uploaded on those topics. The most basic Diels-Alder reaction consists of a diene, in this case this is 1,3-butadiene, a conjugated diene, and ethylene, so just a very simple 2-carbon alkene, reacting at elevated temperature to produce cyclohexene. And the Diels-Alder reaction is an example of what we call a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. And those numbers are 4 from the diene, that's the number of pi electrons that we have in both of those double bonds, and plus 2, so those 2 pi electrons from the alkene, and cycloaddition, because we are forming a cyclic compound, addition, because we are combining these two compounds together. If we draw out the mechanism for the Diels-Alder reaction, it's actually very simple. It occurs in one concerted step. We have our diene here, the butadiene, and our alkene, and we will have the electrons in the pi bond of the alkene attack this terminal carbon of the butadiene. The electrons in this pi bond on the butadiene will swing over to be in between these two carbons, and then the two pi electrons in this double bond will come over to attack the carbon on the alkene, on the ethylene here. And it's worth drawing the transition state for this reaction. We have the carbon backbone from the butadiene, as well as the two carbons from the ethylene. And because of the cyclic movement of these pi electrons, we actually end up with a delocalized system of six pi electrons all throughout this six-membered ring. So we can just draw a dotted line throughout the ring here to signify that those electrons are delocalized throughout all six carbons. And this is what is called an aromatic transition state. If you haven't studied aromatic compounds, just know for now that this six-membered ring configuration with six delocalized pi electrons is incredibly stable. And so this transition state will collapse to the cyclohexene product that we saw just earlier. So for this reaction, we formed two new carbon-carbon bonds, as well as this carbon-carbon double bond on the left side here. Okay, so I mentioned that this is the simplest Diels-Alder reaction, but are there any restrictions on what kinds of compounds we can use for the diene or for this other alkene? Well, it turns out that due to the orbital interactions involved in this reaction, the diene should be relatively electron-rich. So that means that if we have electron-donating substituents on our diene, that will increase its reactivity and allow the reaction to proceed more easily. For example, we have this very simple 1,3-butadiene with no substituents, and this is going to be less reactive than the same compound with one methyl group attached here. So alkyl groups are electron donating, and this will be even less reactive than the dimethyl variant. And then we could draw an even more reactive diene with this methoxy group, because oxygens are very highly electron donating. On the other hand, the other compound that we call the dienophile, so dienophile meaning diene loving, and this is oftentimes an alkene, but it can be other compounds such as alkynes, these need to be relatively electron poor. So that means that if we draw an alkene here, so this is propylene, we have the alkene, but we have a methyl group attached to that, and methyl groups are electron donating, so this is going to reduce the reaction rate. This will be less reactive than just regular ethylene. This will be less reactive, for example, than this ethylene variant with a trifluoromethyl group. So those fluorines are going to withdraw electron density by induction. Then we can have an even more electron withdrawing substituent. This is the cyano group. and this will be even less reactive than the dicyano variant of ethylene. Another restriction we have is that, due to the geometry of the reaction, the diene needs to be in what's called the S-cis configuration. So that means the two double bonds have to be on the same side in order to effectively participate in the reaction. This is in contrast to the S-trans configuration, 
where the two alkenes are on opposite sides of this single bond, and that configuration will be unreactive in diels alder reactions. So these two configurations can interchange when we have something like butadiene that can rotate around that single bond, but if we have a compound that is locked in the S-cis configuration, it is going to be very reactive in diels alder reactions. So if we have this compound, cyclopentadiene, the five-membered ring locks these two alkenes in the S-cis configuration, meaning that this is a very good reagent in diels alder reactions. On the other hand, if we had a compound like this, where we have a cyclopentene ring, and then an alkene coming off of this, so now we have the ring nature of the compound locking it in the S-trans configuration, this compound will not participate in diels alder reactions. So it's important to make sure that we have that ability when we're searching for compounds to participate in these types of reactions. We can also study the stereospecificity of the diels alder reaction. So we've been dealing with pretty simple compounds so far, but if we add some substituents on here, we need to know how the stereochemistry of our product will be affected. So if we start with our 1,3-butadiene, our simplest diene, and react it with this dienophile, so we have our alkene, and we have both of these aldehyde groups, and they're arranged cis on the alkene, so on the same side. If we treat these together at elevated temperature, we will end up with the Diels-Alder product, so remember this will always be a cyclohexene, and because the two aldehyde groups were arranged cis on the original dienophile, they will be cis on this alkene. So we will have both of the aldehyde groups coming up towards us in the cyclohexene product. Next, we can look at a similar reaction where we have the same diene, so this 1,3-butadiene, and then we have this substituted alkene, where we have two trifluoromethyl groups, and these groups are arranged trans on the alkene. And if we combine these at elevated temperature, again, we will have our cyclohexene backbone, and if you might guess from the previous reaction, because these groups are trans on the dienophile, they will be arranged trans on the final ring. So we can choose the trifluoromethyl group on the top to be coming towards us, and the one on the adjacent carbon to be going into the page. And we should also specify that because this compound is optically active, we will also make the enantiomer of this compound, where the configuration at both of these stereocenters has been flipped. Next, let's see how the stereochemistry of the diene affects the stereochemistry of our product. So if we have this diene, where we now have two methyl groups arranged trans on both of these double bonds, and then we react it with a very simple dienophile ethylene, and this will always produce the cyclohexene ring, and in this case, the methyl groups will be arranged cis to each other on the final ring, because both of the double bonds in the diene were arranged trans. So because those double bonds in the original diene had the same geometry, they were both trans, and this would also apply if they were both cis, the compound will be cis in the final product. And in this case, remember, because we have a plane of symmetry, this is actually a meso compound, so we're not going to have any enantiomers to produce or to denote on this product. Next, if we react this diene, which is very similar to the previous one, except I've changed the configuration at the top alkene to now be cis, and again we're reacting it with the same dienophile, just ethylene, this will produce our cyclohexene ring, except now the methyl groups will be arranged trans to each other, because in the original diene, we had one cis double bond and one trans double bond, and because those geometries are opposite, we're going to be creating a trans final product. And in this case, there is no plane of symmetry, so we do need to add that we will produce the enantiomer of this compound. Okay, so we've looked at the stereochemistry of the diene and the dienophile separately, but what if both of those compounds are substituted and we need to determine the stereochemistry of our final product? Well, let's take a look at this diene. So this is the trans-trans variant that I drew a couple reactions ago. And then this dienophile. So we have our alkene, and then we're actually going to have two of these ester groups arranged cis on the alkene. So just as a review, we have a very electron-rich diene, so those methyl groups are going to add electron density to the diene, and the carbonyl groups are going to withdraw electron density from the dienophile. So this should be a pretty smooth Diels-Alder reaction. If we combine these, what are we going to get? 
So we know that we'll always produce the cyclohexene ring. And then let's look at the substituents. So we know that for the dienophile, both of the ester groups are on the same side of the alkene, so they're arranged cis. And remember, that means that they will be cis on the final product. So we can draw both of those ester groups coming out of the page towards us on the final ring. Now we have the question of the stereochemistry of the methyl groups. So we know that this is a trans-trans diene, so both double bonds have the same configuration, which means those methyl groups will be cis on the final product. But are they going to be cis coming out of the page, so on the same side as the ester groups, or are they going to be both on the same side but trans to the ester groups that we already have? Now we can cite another rule that says that the, quote, inside substituents on the diene are going to be trans to the most electron withdrawing groups of the dienophile. So that's a little bit wordy, but let's break that down. So the inside substituents on the diene are going to be both of these hydrogens. So let's draw those in explicitly. And we can call those inside because they're pointing in towards the ring. And then the most electron withdrawing groups on the dienophile, so those are going to be the ester groups. And then we know that those things will be trans. So the hydrogens are going to be trans to the ester groups, which means that if we draw in the hydrogens explicitly on our final product, they will be trans to the ester, so they will be pointing into the page away from us, which means that both methyl groups will be coming out of the page towards us. So it turns out that these methyl groups will actually be all on the same side as the ester groups. So that's how we can determine the stereochemistry of a more complex product of a Diels-Alda reaction. Let's look at one more type of product that might form from a Diels-Alda reaction. So up until now, we've been considering acyclic starting materials forming a single cyclohexene ring. But as I alluded to previously, we can actually use cyclic starting materials. So if we use this cyclopentadiene as our diene, and then we use this rather simple dienophile, so this has two aldehyde groups arranged cis, these will react in a Diels-Alda reaction to still form a cyclohexene ring, and I'm going to be drawing that ring a little bit differently. So I'm going to draw the cyclohexene ring like this, kind of viewing it from the side, and I'm doing that so I can draw the bridging carbon above the ring. And that bridging carbon is coming from the cyclic diene that we started with. So we actually have a bicyclic system now. So take a moment to convince yourself that this is the right backbone of the product, and try to imagine that in your head about how those two rings are bonded together. Okay, so now what happens to those aldehyde substituents? Where are they going to be on this ring? Well, we know that because they're arranged cis in the dienophile, they're going to be cis on the final product. So one option for that is going to be both of the aldehyde groups will be pointing down on this ring. So they will be pointing away from the bridging carbon. And this is actually called the endo product. On the other hand, we could have the same backbone, the same bicyclic system, but now both of the aldehyde groups will be pointing up on this ring. So they will be on the same side as the bridging carbon. And this is known as the exo product. And again, due to the interactions of the molecular orbitals of the diene and dienophile, it turns out that the endo product is generally favored in Diels-Alder reactions. So again, this endo product is going to be formed when we have a cyclic starting material, and those substituents are going to be opposite of the bridging carbon in our final product. Okay, finally, we're going to briefly discuss the regioselectivity of the Diels-Alder reaction. If we react this diene, so we have this one methyl group on one of the inner carbons of the alkene, and our dienophile is only going to have this one aldehyde substituent, the product of the Diels-Alder reaction between these two compounds is, as usual, going to be a cyclohexene ring. And we know that this methyl group only has one place to be, so we can just put it on this carbon here. Remember, it has no options for stereochemistry because it's on this sp2 hybridized carbon instead of one of the sp3 hybridized carbons adjacent to it. But we can imagine two positions for the aldehyde group one of those is going to be on this carbon, so we can draw this coming out of the plane towards us. And this is what's known as the 1,4 product. So 1,4 meaning the methyl group is on carbon 1, and the aldehyde group is on carbon number 4 if we number around the ring. However, if we just flip the dienophile over before our reaction, 
We can also imagine this product, where the aldehyde is going to be on the 3 carbon. So from the 3 carbon, we get a 1, 3 product. And if we want to be very thorough, we can remember that this second product will have an enantiomer because it is optically active. And yet again, because of the orbital interactions that are happening in the transition state of the diels alder reaction, the 1, 3 product is actually going to be disfavored in the reaction. So most of the time we're going to end up with either 1, 4 addition or 1, 2 addition instead of the 1, 3 product drawn here. So that's also important to take into consideration when you're determining the products of diels alder reactions. So that concludes my video on diels alder reactions and a lot of the properties of this reaction. If you like this video, please go ahead and like and subscribe to my channel. Find me on social media and take a look at my website on the screen. And finally, if you're willing and able, please consider donating to my Patreon page, which allows me to continue creating all of this content for you. Thanks for watching.